Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Algorithm Class. Today, we're going to talk about a classic algorithm in graph theory, the floyd warshall algorithm for finding the shortest paths between all pairs of nodes in a graph. If you're currently studying graph algorithms or preparing for technical interviews, this is definitely an episode you don't want to miss. Before diving into the algorithm itself, let's think about a simple question. If we want to find the shortest path between any two nodes in a graph, how can we do that? Some people might think of Dijkstra's algorithm, and that's a great choice. It's a very efficient way to find the shortest paths from a single source node to all other nodes. It works by starting from one point and expanding outward, always choosing the shortest known path at each step. This is a classic greedy algorithm. But Dijkstra's algorithm is designed for single source shortest paths. If we want to find the shortest paths between every pair of nodes, we'd have to run it once from each node, for a total of n times. That's where the floyd warshall algorithm comes in. It was designed specifically for this kind of all pairs shortest path problem. Instead of running an algorithm multiple times, it computes the shortest paths between all pairs of nodes in one go. The idea behind floyd warshall is also really clever. Instead of expanding outward from a single starting point like Dijkstra does, it tries something different. It checks whether inserting an intermediate node, let's call it k, between two nodes i and j can lead to a shorter path. It's a completely different approach, and it's based on dynamic programming. So how does this algorithm actually work? Let's walk through it step by step, using both the Python code and a visual example. Take a look at the graph on the right side of the screen. It has four nodes, labeled from 0 to 3. The edges and their weights are shown in the diagram. Notice that the edge from node 2 to node 0 has a weight of negative 2. That means this graph includes a negative edge weight. And yes, floyd warshall supports negative weights, which is a big advantage. However, the graph must not contain any negative cycles. If it does, the idea of a shortest path just breaks down. The good news is, floyd warshall can actually detect negative cycles on its own. Now, let's look at the code on the left. This floyd warshall function is the core implementation of the algorithm. It's not too complex. It's made up of three main parts. Initialization, a triple nested loop for updating distances and paths, and a check for negative cycles. First, let's take a look at the input. The function takes a graph as its parameter. Right below the function, we define a sample graph using a two-dimensional array. This sample matches exactly the visual graph you see on the right. And up in the top right corner, we've got its adjacency matrix representation. Each entry at position ij shows the weight of the edge from node i to node j. For example, the edge from node 0 to node 1 has a weight of 4, so position 0, 1 is 4. If there's no direct edge between two nodes, we use infinity to represent that. For instance, there's no direct edge from node 1 to node 2, so position 1, 2 is infinity. As for the diagonal entries, they're all set to 0, since the distance from any node to itself is always 0. Back in the function, we start with the initialization step. First, we make a copy of the original graph and call it the distance matrix, dist for short. This will be used to keep track of the shortest distances we've known so far. We also create a next matrix to store the next hop node for each path. This will be useful later when we need to reconstruct the actual shortest paths. At the beginning, if there's a direct edge from i to j, we set next ij equals to j, meaning we can go straight from i to j. If there's no edge, we leave it as null or empty. To make it easier to visualize, we label the original distance and next matrices as distance 0 and next 0. That way, we can compare them with later versions as the algorithm runs. Now we dive into the core of the algorithm, the triple nested loop. The outer loop iterates through all possible intermediate nodes, labeled as k. Inside that, we loop through every pair of nodes i and j. For each pair, we check. If there's a path from i to k and from k to j, and if going through k results in a shorter path, we update both the distance and the next hop node accordingly. For example, in the first round, when k equals 0, 
we're checking whether using node 0 as an intermediate point can help shorten any of the existing paths. After that round finishes, we get new matrices, distance 1 and next 1. By comparing distance 0 and distance 1, we can see what changed. For instance, the path from node 3 to node 1 was originally unreachable, infinity. But if we go from 3 to 0, cost 3, and from 0 to 1, cost 4, the total is 7. That's shorter than infinity, so we update distance 3, 1 to 7 and set next 3, 1 to 0, indicating the next hop is node 0. Similarly, the path from node 3 to node 2 is updated. Going through node 0 gives a total cost of 6, which is better than infinity. The distance from node 2 to node 1 is also improved. Going through node 0 reduces the cost from infinity to 2. In the later rounds, we just repeat the same process. We set k to 1, then to 2, and finally to 3, each time checking whether going through the current k can give us a shorter path. At the end of the second round, for example, when k equals 1, the distances from node 0 to 3 and from 2 to 3 get shorter. You're welcome to pause the video and take a closer look at why those changes happened. In the third round, k equals 2, nothing changes. That means adding node 2 as an intermediate point doesn't help shorten any paths in this round. Finally, after the fourth round, when k equals 3, we end up with the final versions of the distance and next matrices. These now contain the shortest distances and the corresponding paths between every pair of nodes. Now, we can use the next matrix to reconstruct the actual path between any two nodes. For example, to find the shortest path from node 2 to node 3, we start with next 2 3, which gives us 0. Then we check next 0 3, which gives us 1. Finally, we check next 1 3, which gives us 3. So the path is from node 2 to node 0, then to node 1, and finally to node 3. The total distance is found in distance 2 3, which is 4. The last step of the algorithm is checking for negative cycles. To do this, we examine the diagonal of the distance matrix. If any value on the diagonal is negative, it means that a node has a path to itself with a negative total cost, indicating the presence of a negative cycle. If there is a negative cycle, the shortest path results are no longer valid because the path can be infinitely shortened by cycling through the negative cycle. So, how efficient is the floyd warshall algorithm? Well, it uses three nested loops, each running n times, so the time complexity is O of n cubed. That might sound expensive, but in many cases, it's totally worth it. Not only does it compute all pairs' shortest paths in a single run, but it also allows us to easily reconstruct the actual paths, supports negative edge weights, and can even detect negative cycles. If your graph has only a few nodes, is relatively dense, or if you need to frequently query the shortest paths between different pairs of nodes, then the floyd warshall algorithm is a great fit. All right, that's it for today's video on the floyd warshall algorithm. If you found it helpful, be sure to give it a like, leave a comment, and subscribe to the channel. Your support really helps me keep making more videos like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.